Welcome to the Hawkcast with your host, AJ Hawk. Andrew Hawkins is with us right now. Andrew, appreciate it, man. You have a nice background as well for the people watching on YouTube. Uh, I know we were just talking off off mic that a lot of people, the majority of people listen on iTunes, but I feel like it's a good thing for people to see you and people want to want to see what you're all about, man. So thanks for coming on. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. Yes, my man came, man. I put a lot of time and effort into it. Yeah, I see your jersey. So you got your, is that your Toledo jersey over your left shoulder? I got my Toledo jersey. I got my, my reality show jersey, high school, Canada, Browns, and Bengals. Oh, talk about that reality show. I want It was Michael Irvin's show in 2009. What was that? Bro, it was the craziest thing I've ever done in my life. So basically, he took 12 guys off the street and six DBs, six receivers, and he basically let them compete for 10 episodes. We were there for like two and a half months filming. And the winner got to uh, have go sign a contract with the Cleveland – or I mean not Cleveland Browns, the Dallas Cowboys. And that was at a time where I was like out of football. Like I had a whole year off. And, um, you know, it was like, oh, man, this is perfect. And I got runner up. But I should have won. I actually just found out that Michael Irvin, I have him on video saying that I won the show hands down. But, but the ESPN piece that it was on never aired. So I have it in my in my downloads right now. What happened? Was some some political garbage? Like, why didn't they give you the, the, the title? You know what I mean? I think more than anything, it was like, you know, I'm, I'm five, six and a half. You know, like, and it's the Dallas Cowboys. So it's one thing to have the Dallas Cowboys having finding players from reality show. It's another thing for the winner of that show to be a five six receiver. So I just feel like it was like too many oddities for them to get over the hump, and you know they sent me off into the wilderness to to find my own way. So who was the kid that won? Jesse Holly won. Did he make the team? He didn't make. He ended up making the team. He was a special teamer. He played like his first year was on practice. I think he got active halfway through maybe his second year. And then I think uh, he feels it out after that. But I want to say he got two or three years in, which was, you know, that's a big deal in itself. You know what I mean? And spe- I, I can't imagine that would in 2017 that a show like that would ever happen again to where a team would freely sign a guy from a reality show. Yeah, I don't know. I, you know, I think Jerry Jones is just a, a fan of flair, man. And I think it was just another opportunity to put the star on TV and, you know, just kind of dip his foot in more business it was actually a successful show. i mean we had two nfl players from it so you know it wasn't it couldn't have been terrible no that's, that's pretty amazing and i guess if it jerry is pretty much the only owner i could see that would green light that show right right it was one season I, it never came back for i think there were some other reasons that you know some other situations that happened but yeah you don't think uh mike brown's doing that in cincinnati Heck no! <laughs> Heck no! Mike Ryan doing that. Hey, Mike Brown's not paying for it. That's for that's for dang sure. <laughs> so, how many years were you uh, on the Bengals? I was in the Bengals three seasons. Okay, and that what was your first season there? My first season there was 2011. So I came in with uh, Andy Dalton and AJ Green. That was like the year when Carson Palmer was refusing to come to the facility, and they had just traded Ocho Cinco during a lockout. You know, so like the stars aligned for pretty much all of us <laughs> at the time. Yeah, Andy was on here a couple months back, actually. And he talked about that. That was the start of the new regime. Like, T.O. Mm-hmm. was gone at the time, right? Would he they he booted they booted him at the same time. They bring in Andy, yep. AJ, yourself. So you got to you got to get in early when like everything was changing. I guess for the better, really. They they became a lot more successful. But what was that? That was your first like legit NFL shot you got where you made it and got playing time, wasn't it? Yeah, man. So I, I, after I got from, I played two years in Canada at the reality show, and then I signed down with the Rams. So I worked out for the Bengals and the Rams. Signed with the Rams because, like you said, they had T.O. Ocho, Jordan Shipley, like all these names at the Bengals. So I signed with the Rams. The lockout happened, so no off season for the five six receiver. The lockout ends. I drive thirteen hours from Pennsylvania to St. Louis. I practice once, and then they cut me the next morning. <laughs> wow. And I drove all the way back to Pennsylvania. Luckily, the Bengals claimed me off waivers, and that's how I ended up there. Did they tell you why you were going? If they had to know you were gonna, you weren't gonna last. Why they made you even come in? You know, I, that's like the thing that makes me the most mad. I mean, they knew they were gonna cut me before I even got there, so I would have much rather I saved the gas money. But they ended up, you know, they said, "Oh, we needed a spot for DBs, or you know, whatever." We're gonna, they said, "We're gonna give you the chance 
to go play somewhere else. I'm like, oh, okay, well, thanks. I appreciate it. <laughs> but that has to be saying something that they cut you and the Bengals pick you up off waivers. People don't really mm-hmm. understand waivers, what the team, any team has 24 hours to claim you, yeah. I guess. But to be picked up, normally you would you would think a guy that was there one day and if you hadn't really made a – had your, your, your good shot in the league that – you would clear waivers and you'd be fine to go. Like, what made the Bengals pick you up? You know, I had a great workout there, number one. Um, I have history there because my older brother played there six years um, for Marvin Lewis. And I think number three, they they had, like, three receivers in the first two days of camp go down with hamstrings. Now, some were really hamstring and some were people didn't feel like practicing. So, again, the Stars line, I can be the first practice, man. Like, I, like, got to practice late, changed my clothes, and as soon as I got out there, they, they put me in, like, with the ones and gave me a reverse. And I'm like, dude, I'm, like, in it, in it. <laughs> like, it was wild. Yeah, you were ready for your opportunity, though. As you say, the stars aligned, but you took full advantage of that. How long was it through that camp? Uh, like, did you ever feel comfortable? Like, oh, this is good. I, I'm set. I'm going to make the team. No, man, not at all. I uh, I can remember, like, Maybe a week in, and Jay Gruden is, uh, you know, I love him like family. But I can remember like a week in, I mean, you get the feels. Like, you know, okay, he's not putting me in on offense. So I had to like walk up to the special teams coach like, hey, I can tackle. And they kind of blew me off. And I'm like, no, I can tackle. So we like we went to a walkthrough. And I was going like balls out at Gunner at this walkthrough just to show him like, you know, what I could do. And they ended up throwing me in the game. And I made a couple plays. And it, they started to kind of take notice more. And then they started to let me do more things. But – I didn't. I was. On, I started off on a practice squad. Jordan Shipley tore his ACL like week two or three. They activated me, um, and I started playing maybe two games in and maybe on an active roster. But like it was like nine, ten weeks in, and I remember uh, EB, who's the player development, he came over because I was staying in a hotel and like my bags were completely packed. <laughs> you know? And he was like, "What is? You, did you go somewhere?" I'm like, "No, I just I was using my suitcase as my drawer, so I would keep it packed because I thought I was going to get cut." <laughs> <laughs> every day and i wanted to get out as fast as possible when it happened <laughs> wow so when they activated you from the practice squad uh how was that first game the first game action oh it was nuts man it was like a lot of emotion um i went to the first play i played it threw me andy threw me a screen and it went for like 25 yards and i remember just thinking like after the game my brother and i went to chipotle and i was just telling him, like man i'm in the stats book like they could never say I didn't play in the NFL because I had a catch and it was 25 yards. So no matter what, I'm always going to be here. So, you know, it was it was like a surreal feeling, man. But in your, I mean, it's crazy to think you were only there three seasons because I, I mean, maybe it's because I'm from Ohio. I live in Ohio, although at that time I was living in Green Bay for most of the year. But it seems like you had such an impact there and you were an instant hit with the fans. You think part of that is because you're, you're like you said, what, five, six and a half and, and people relate and feel like, feel good about watching you? No question, man. It's crazy because I, I like, my, like I said, my brother played at the University of Cincinnati, right? And he was like one of the highest draft picks in school history. He got drafted to the Bengals second round, played there six years. And then here I come, like not much long after that. And, they called me Baby Hawk. That's like my nickname in Cincinnati. They all call me Baby Hawk. And I think like the the little engine that could, they kind of just took to me, man. And I was like a fan favorite. You know, and they looked at me like a native son. Everyone kind of thought I was from Cincinnati. They considered me a local, you know. So, I mean, that was like an incredible experience in itself because I, I just couldn't believe people really cared to root for me, man. But the city of Cincinnati, like I said, they – you know, they, they took me under their wing. Did you ever have any, like, um, like welcome to the NFL moment or, like, where the quarterback or Jay Gruden or someone comes over to you and shakes your hand and says, good job, kid, you're one of us? Like, one of those cheesy movie movie time, like, things? Um, I don't think so. Not as much – not so much that. Uh, the special team coach, after I made the practice squad, he told me – like, he pulled me aside and said, you know, you prove that you have the talent, now you got to prove you belong. So that was like a moment. Um, welcome to the NFL moment was probably Troy Palomalu smacking me. And like I literally did like four flips. And this is like the first game, like real game action I got because like AJ got hurt and I had to like go in and play play. And uh, yeah, Palomalu, like he blessed my soul a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> What's the, uh, I don't, I, I'm sorry, I was, so I, was in, I was on Cincinnati for a year. What's the special teams coach name again? 
Darren Simmons. Oh, Darren. I'm sorry, Darren, if he somehow finds this, which he won't, because he's, he's grinding away in the film room. Uh, exactly. Darren was the man. I, I sat in all the special teams meetings, no matter what, whether I was on him or not, and mainly because I was so – like I, maybe because I was new and I hadn't been there for a super long time, but Darren was absolutely hilarious to me. And he would like – he would say all these crazy jokes and that were just – I would I would literally be sitting there laughing and he would like oh god thanks thanks AJ's here damn no one else gets my jokes I think because they're all checked out and I'm just sitting there eating up all of Darren's cheesy material. Darren's one of my favorite coaches in the world, man. Like seriously, I love the the way he commands me. I, I always say I think Darren's going to be a head coach in the NFL one day. Yeah, that's what I like. He is, he's been there forever and he's a great proven special teams coach. He knows what he's doing. I feel like mm-hmm. he, he's a perfect mixture of. Like the crazy special team mentality, which all of them have. Every special team coach is nuts, and on game day they're going to be losing their mind. But he has that. But he he knows how to run a meeting, and he has the respect of everybody to where he's not just going to make you run into each other full go every single practice. Like he's going to teach you how to fit everything, and and not just do things to do things. Like I I really respected him. Yeah, and and everybody does. Man. I mean, even bouncing around, like you know, from the Patriots to the Browns, everyone has like a tremendous amount of respect for what. Darren does, and the players as well. If you notice in, in Cincinnati, they take special teams. You know, I mean, some some teams aren't like that. Some teams, the players are like, oh, okay, whatever. But, you know, in Cincinnati, it's a big deal, and it's because of the, the respect Darren commands and the standard he holds them to. You know what I mean? Yeah, it really is, man. So, yeah, I, I don't know what his – what his. Uh, I wish I would have sat down and, and talked to him sometime about what his, like, future goals may be if he does want to bump up and, and try to get a head coaching gig somewhere. Yeah. I, I can see it happening eventually. I don't think he's pressed about it. You know, he's just trying to win games, man. You know how Darren is. Oh yeah, he's he'd be uh, he'd be making fun of us right now. He'd definitely making fun of me. Oh, AJ, <laughs> AJ thinks he's Walter Cronkite or something out there. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's good, man. What it, so you? Uh, what about coaching? I, I like to ask guys that that have recently retired. You ever think about getting into it? You know, I love coaching. I love helping young guys develop. Um, I don't know if I like sitting in the office for fifteen hours a day or you know, missing kids' birthdays and, you know, some of the things that come along with coaching. Maybe eventually, maybe I got to remove myself a little bit to miss it. But right now, I just couldn't see myself coaching, at least at the the college or the professional level. Maybe high school. Okay. Maybe high school. Are you staying in Cleveland still? Yeah, I'm in Cleveland right now, just kind of, you know, in the transition process, trying to figure out what is the best next step to take and kind of navigate some of the opportunities that have presented themselves. So what happened with your, I, I don't know if you were playing it for a long time, but your retirement kind of took me by surprise. You, you signed with the mm-hmm. Patriots back in May. And before I even let you answer, I have to say, I, I feel like an idiot now that you retired. I, I, on one of the serious shows I was doing, we were talking about um, like the Patriots and the off season, everything they did. And I was like, I'll tell you guys what, the guy that you got to look out for, I said, Andrew Hawkins. I was like, he is no joke. Watch out for this guy. And they're like, man, they have a ton of receivers on that roster. I was like, I don't care. They're going to have to cut one of them because this dude can flat out play. I said, if he's healthy, he's going to be on the team. He's going to be making plays. And then he retired. I'm like, oh, man, I hope no one, no one's going back on demand and listening to that episode. <laughs> yeah, man, I mean, I had a great spring. Um, you know, and I felt good, honestly. I was, like, moving probably the best that I have in a long time. You know, but, like, and I don't know if you, your your experience might be similar, but like you know, you have aches and pains, right? Because you played so many years of football. So like, knees hurt, shoulders hurt, ankles hurt, whatever. And then what happens is, for me at least, like during closer to camp, like your body just kind of corrects itself, almost like almost like it knows camp is coming. Like so, like I would have aches, and then like you know, midway through July, it would just go away. And it was almost like okay, your body's like it's time to go to work, right? Well, this year was the first year it didn't do that, and it actually did the opposite. Like, it's like my knee started swelling up, and I'm okay. Let me take a break. I took a break on it, and then it like started to feel worse, and then a little fluid, and then pain up and down steps, and it started locking out, locking up on me in workout. So, I got it checked out, and they were like, "Okay, well, you can either do, you know, some PRP shot or cortisone." And I'm just like, you know, I, at this point, I'm like, I don't want to feel like I'm just hanging on or going through the motions or if I miss three weeks in Patriots camp, I know what my fate is going to be. So it was just like, you know, I just, it's just time, man. It's just time. Was it something you had thought about before that summer, before, as you say, the aches and pains didn't go away? Yeah. I mean, I, I've always thought about like, you know, when, when I was going to walk away and I've always kind of prepared for it. Um, you know, see, it's weird because, you know, like I wasn't like a, four-star recruit. I wasn't an All-American in college. 
I wasn't a guy that was like, you know what, my goal is to go be Super Bowl MVP. My literal goal was to play one game in the NFL. Like, so when I tell you the story about the catch, like, had they cut me the next day, I would have went out, I would have got a job, I would have been satisfied. Like, so anything beyond that was icing on the cake. So when you have that mentality of like, okay, one game, and then one game comes, and then two games, and it's like you don't, not that you don't care when it ends or, when, you know, but the reality is, I mean, it's literally beyond what you thought was going to happen. And there's only, there's only so much you can readjust your goals. You know what I mean? Yeah, that, that's all, that's something that a lot of guys, I think, athletes don't have. Like, you you must have stuff off the field that you're passionate about, that you care about. You don't identify only as a football player. That's the Those are the guys that really, really struggle when they're done. It's people like, all they know is football. They never thought about life after football. And it's like they assume they could play till they're 80 years old and just die, which nobody does. So what you you obviously had some kind of foundation and stuff that you were already planning on doing. Yeah, man. I think uh, the fact that I'm my older brother was so you know decorated had something to do with it because no one ever expected anything of me. So it's almost like you kind of don't expect it of yourself, right? Which I'm sure Ryan could attest to. Like some of your younger brother, it's like okay, you're going to set up all these, which is probably why Ryan is such a business guru himself. Because yeah. he understood, like, okay, well, that's his thing. And, you know, so that's how my mindset always was. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I just always knew the end was coming or that the end was near or that, okay, it might not last or whatever it is. I want to make sure that I'm prepared so that, you know, on the back end, I'm not struggling or, or going through some of the pitfall falls that a lot of our peers go through. So what was your – getting back to your, your time with the Patriots, so you were there for the spring and, I guess, summer mm -hmm. and – and then right before camp, you you just recently retired. What was it like there? Being just the couple months you spent in that facility around their culture, like what was it? What you thought it was going to be? It was that, and then some, man. Like literally, the first day you're there, you see exactly why they are who they are, why they win so much, why they're so successful. I've never been in like an environment where everything was kind of so linear and on the same page. Like I'm talking down from you know, the lunch ladies to the got the equipment guys to the scouts. It's like their only focus is winning football games year round. Um, and the amount of effort they put into everything they do, it's, it's a special environment, man. You have to be a certain kind of player, coach, um, scout to be in that environment and thrive because they set such high standards. Was there any time for fun? Like, do you guys have a good time? You, uh, winning is fun. That's like their mentality. Like, you know what's fun? Super Bowls. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> you know, it's, hard, it's hard to argue that. You know what I mean? Yeah, man. If you're if you're winning, you, you can get away with anything. If you're the coach or whatever, whoever it is, like winning kind of cures all. And then if for some reason they went downhill, then it's when you start hearing guys start to gripe about different schedules and what you're doing. Exactly, exactly. Which is why, you know, some of the other organizations ha have that issue. It's like any other job. It's like, you know, the people that are, are working at – on wall street aren't saying oh it's never fun you know what i mean they're working they're they're making money they have a job and they're trying to do it to the best of their abilities and that's how the patriots approach it like listen we're here for a job we're not here to you know it's not summer camp this is we're here to win football games you know so yeah there it's an interesting thing i, I love talking to guys that have spent any time in new england it's just it for some reason whatever it is there's there's something i talk to my brothers and different people and they're always so curious about what goes on behind the doors there like what they do that's so different and first off they have tom brady that's that's number one that's one <laughs> and then one a is bill belichick those two go hand in hand like i don't know either you could argue is 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 tom the same without belichick i think a player is a player but belichick definitely puts him in position to be who he is but i wonder if so let's say let's say tom retires in two years do you think belichick goes with him I don't think so. No. I mean, from what I've seen, it doesn't, you know, he's a football coach. He's about winning football games. He's about coaching football. You know, I, I don't think it's a package. I could be wrong. But, I mean, not even Tom. They have a lot of talent on the team. The backup quarterback doesn't miss throws. The third string quarterback is a starting NFL quarterback. I'm telling you that right now. Like, you know, being in that environment, seeing the way that they compete, the standard they hold each other to and themselves to, it was like, man, top to bottom, man. Like I've never, I've literally never seen anything like it. Yeah, something special, man. They're doing something that no one 
has really been. Yeah. And no one, I, I doubt anyone will be able to duplicate that in the new era. I know back in the day, like the Steelers and teams and kind of had these dynasties, but the Patriots did it in modern, like modern day football, which is harder yeah. and harder. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they built it, man. It's like, and I think that's why guys who come from the Patriots or like, whether that's, you know, GMs, head coaches, quarterbacks, I think that's why they struggle in other places because, you know, the Patriots have had the time to put those building blocks in place and they have such a strong foundation that you can't just readily duplicate with somebody else because they came from that tree. It takes time to build that. And, that, and you know, they have that going for them, man. When you were in Cleveland, who was uh, the head coach? I was there for Petten was when I came and Hugh Jackson was there when I left. Okay, so you were there. Hugh, so he was the offensive coordinator when I was in Cincinnati. Um, yep. I, I love you. What, what do you think about him? I think he's an offensive guru and, and knows how to command a room. No question, man. I think Hugh is going to turn the Cleveland Browns around. I say that, you know, even as a guy who, who left there, but he was like, like you said, the way he commanded the room, the amount of respect that he gets from players, the way that he cares for players, it's like, it's, it's just unusual. You know what I mean? Like you, Like coaches, it's a business. They're trying to like I said, win games, and he's trying to do that too, but you just got a guy who players know genuinely cares about him, and, you know, I mean, we were outmatched last year from a lot for a lot of reasons. We had 23 rookies on the active roster at one time, so it was like, you know, just, just some games, talent-wise, we couldn't compete and we couldn't win, um, but the way that they fought for him from the beginning and all year long was because of the guy Hugh is and the kind of football coach he is, and if he gets time in Cleveland, I have no doubt that he's going to turn the franchise around. What do you say? You you live in Cleveland, so what do you say when people, I'm sure, come up to you and ask like, what, what's the deal? What's the problem? Are we going to finally put it together and win this year? Like, what what's your answer? I mean, it's just like what we talked about the foundation. They have to be able to put those, you know, blocks in place and give them enough time for the roots to sink in, so that they can reap the benefits, right? And I, I feel like they have that with you. They have that with Sashi Brown. Um, Mr. Haslam is on board with everything that they're doing. And it's like when I left, it felt like an organization that was moving in the right direction and all in the same direction. So they just have to continue to give that time and just let the, the pieces fall where they need to be. Well, they went out and spent a bunch of money on O-Lyman, so that's probably a good start. Protecting your, yeah. protecting your guy, whoever it is that the starter will be, I guess, coming yeah. coming into the year. But, man, they uh, I hope for Hugh's sake that they are they do play well. Like they, he, yeah. he's got does it the right way, and he was he was a fun mixture of, and like I said, I was only around him for a year, but I did get to talk to him a lot, and I would see him walking through the locker room every morning when he'd be getting his breakfast, and it was like, it'd be five fifty in the morning, and he was walking with eggs, whistling and singing and dancing. Oh, what's up, Hawk? Hey, AJ, what's going on? And he'd talk, and he's really cool. And I'd listen to, I'd watch him in his offensive meetings, and different things, and he is a perfect mixture of. Like, as you said, you you know he cares about you. He really does, but he absolutely does not put up with anything. And you, you're not going to be late. You're not going to loaf on a route. You're not going to – you're going to break the huddle, right? Like, he has that fine line, which a lot of coaches don't have. They're either too push – like a pushover or they're way too much like a drill instructor. Exactly. Exactly. You know, like, a good example of exactly what you just talked about is Josh Gordon. I play with Josh Gordon, um, and Josh Gordon has had some issues. Josh Gordon is an incredible talent, like – you know, one of the most talented receivers I've ever seen in my life, physically gifted, incredible athlete. But the thing with Josh is since I've been there, he couldn't – He the coaches couldn't command Josh's respect. You know, and the ways they would do it would be a bunch of different ways, kind of like you said, whether it's drill sergeant, whether it's, um, you know, fine, whatever it is. Like he came in with Hugh, and Hugh was at, on, like kind of on the fence. Like I don't know what, what it's going to be. I've heard stories. I don't know what kind of kid he is. I've never seen Josh Gordon work harder in the three or four years that I've known him and played with him. And it wasn't because of anything special. It was just the fact that the Hughes presence and the standard he sets for the guys around him, it like, you know, Josh kind of knew like, okay, well, I can't come in here with anything less than my best. And had Josh not been, got had to, you know, check into rehab or suspended, whatever the situation was, he would have been probably the top receiver in the NFL that year. Because he looked incredible, yo. I like I promise, like, it was amazing to watch. Like I like between him on one side and uh Terrell Brown on the other, I'm like, dude, this is gonna get scary for DBs. Yeah, two big monsters that can run and go get the ball. 
Jeez, man. Wow. What? So, what's his status now? Is is he like suspended indefinitely? Where Where is he? I think that's the situation. I, you know, I haven't talked to him in a couple of months. Um, reached out to him a couple of times, but you know, I mean, everyone has their issues or problems they're going through, man. And you know, I just pray that he gets it together and gets the opportunity, man, because there's so much talent. Like, oh man, it's so much talent. But yeah, I mean, I, I think right now that the situation is he's suspended indefinitely, and you know, there's it's a hard situation to be in, man. Oh, so man, you definitely played with some some characters. You were you were there with Johnny Football's rookie year, weren't you? I was I was there for the Johnny Football man, series. How did that experiment go? I mean, we know what happened on the field, but what? Yeah, like the hype around I, him, like the circus around him. How was it dealing with that? You know, I, I, I honestly it was cool because, and I, all right, let me back that up. So in Cincinnati, <laughs> you know, it's a very like kind of modest town. Like Cincinnati has a lot of pub now, and they get you know, talked about a certain way, but at the time people weren't holding us in that regard. And there wasn't like a bunch of like, you know, press or hoopla around what we were doing. When you got to Cleveland, man, there was like reporters. There was, besides the fact that the fan base is crazy, it brought a lot of attention to the team because of Johnny. Um, you know, so that wasn't a distraction for us. And I just feel like Johnny and himself, you know, he was going through his personal issues and, like you said, you've seen a lot of it kind of trickle down to to the field. Yeah, there was an interesting pick for the the Browns to go out and take him. I I wonder whose decision that finally was. Did they talk about that? Who it was? Oh, what's up? It's your little son. Yeah, this is my this is my son. Say hi, Austin. Hi. Hey, buddy. How old are you? How old are you? Five. Five. What's your favorite team? Daddy's team. That's a good answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a video you made. Perfect. <laughs> he's learned <laughs> what was that video you posted a, a while back what did you didn't you he was on the other side of the door yeah i had to kick him out because uh aj was his favorite player <laughs> <laughs> when you were on the wasn't that weren't you on the browns at the time yeah i was on the browns and uh aj and most knew were his favorites <laughs> oh that's awesome man five how many kids do you have i have three i have a five-year-old son and then twin two-year-old girls oh man busy house yeah that's oh yeah Oh yeah, that's awesome. Did, did you uh, were you ever weary of having kids while you were still playing? I wasn't weary of it. Um, I will say that's been the the best part about not being in camp is being able to wake up with the kids. You know what I mean? I think because usually when you're know, during the season and during these times, you're if you're at the house, you you're waking up, you're giving them a kiss, and they're asleep, and you don't see them till late. Like so, that's like the coolest part for me. I was telling my wife that I can wake up where they're they're coming to wake me up now, you know, and they're jumping in the bed, and I'm like, you know, this is what I've been missing for a long time. So that's that's like really cool for me. Do they ask you? I guess I don't know about your two hundred year old, but I would imagine your five year old. Does he ask you if you're going to play football? Like, your dad, are you gonna go play if he sees it on TV? Yeah, I mean, nah, because I think he knows. I mean, he's he's a football head. <laughs> like, he can name you. All the players, all the teams, all the quarterbacks, you know, what city they're in, the records. So he understands. So we had he was the first person I talked to about retiring. So I had to okay with him first. Once he was okay with it, I knew I was good to go. That's awesome. He was cool with it, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He wasn't he was happy to have me back around. He wasn't happy not seeing me on the field because he likes me playing. I like it, man. Are you gonna uh, does he what what's his plans moving forward? Like, are you going to ever try to keep him away from football? That's like the whole hot topic now. Would you let your son play? You know, I I would let him play later on. Like, so my older brother, who's his son, is like a four star recruit, um, offered from Ohio State, Alabama, Clemson, everybody, you name it. Um, and my son, my brother's philosophy was football players are born and not made. So he didn't let him start playing until eighth grade. So after two or three years of football, he got off from everybody. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? I kind of agree with that. There's some development things you can do in the meantime, but I just don't think it's necessary for, you know, guys who are using football as a business, as I do, as our family does, as far as scholarships, making a living. You know, he doesn't have to play until he's in high school, and that's probably what I would do with my son. Yeah, an athlete's an athlete. You, you can't make someone yeah. athletic. You're not going to drill athletic ability into a kid. Right, and if you're tough, you're tough. Like, I know tough guys that never played football that'll go out there not scared, will hit whatever's moving, and you know, I mean, it's just it's just in you. That's true, man. I actually had a, a an argument with a D lineman once about that. He, I was talking about some young kid, a young D lineman, like, how's how's this guy doing? And he said, 
oh, he's not, he's not very tough. So we're really, we're really making him get in there and we're, we're going to toughen him up. We'll get him ready. And I was like, no, I was like, if you're tough, you're tough, man. Like you're not going to make someone tough. It doesn't happen. And eventually he came around and he said, you know what, AJ, you're right. Yeah. I mean, it's very simple. I mean, you've seen it. You've seen guys that you're like, you know, some guy might be a specimen because they're not, the toughness isn't there. I mean, football is like, you have to be tough. You have to be able to hit, take a hit, or you have to be a freak, you know, technically. And it's like, you know, you just can't force that kind of thing. Now, being the the small stature you are, did you just naturally have to find a way not to take big shots? I feel like 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 Randall Cobb and slot receivers. I played with Randall, and Randall just he seems to find a way to not take huge shots. They can like shimmy down or just turn a shoulder. They just you guys find a way. Might be losing you a little bit, AJ. Can you find? Can you hear me? I got you now. You hear me? Hello. Yep, I got you. Oh, it might, be little delay. might be my connection. Yeah. Is it a delay? Yeah, a little bit. Is it, how is it now? A uh, little better. Hold on. Let me, let me try to move. I might change the center. Give me one oh, second. Yeah, you're good. We'll, this part might do we'll splice together. Okay. Nope. Keep it down, babe. <laughs> Let's see if that works. That work at all? Yeah, it looks all right. Is the delay still there? Uh, no, I think we're good, man. Oh, cool. Okay, I um I don't know if you heard or not. I asked you like, did you being the being? I'll give you five seven. I think you should say you're five seven. First off, what do you say? Five six and a half? Yeah, yeah. I, I usually say five six. It makes the story better. So I was five six and a half. <laughs> they put me at five seven. You know, it makes the story better if I'm five six. Yeah, I guess it's like Muggsy Bogues in the dunk contest. Are you too young? Exactly. I don't know if you're too young for that, but I don't know when that even was. But Muggsy Bogues, the little dude. Good. Yeah, yeah, that's my guy, man. Yeah, he's he's the man. Like, did you did you naturally do you think just out of pure survival find a way to to sliver in and out and not take huge shots from people? You know what? No, <laughs> I'm like the complete opposite. I take the, if you go on my Instagram right now, I put out a video like two weeks ago of like the biggest shots that I've taken, and it's it's like it's brutal to watch because <laughs> like my problem was always like. Because I'm small, I had to prove I was a tough guy. So I never ran out of bounds. I never went down. I never, you know, didn't fight for extra yards. Always like so I literally take every hit like everybody else and probably even more. Like to the point where people had to pull me aside and say, Hey, don't don't do this. Don't take this hit or slide my like my dad hates it. He's like, Why don't you just go down? I'm like, I can't because if I prove I'm not tough, they're gonna get rid of me. So yeah, I was always the opposite, man. I was the opposite. Wow. How's your head? Did you get many concussions? I did. I got a lot of concussions, <laughs> man. So, uh, <laughs> did that play? Was that right now, was that part of your, your uh, was that in your head when you were thinking about retiring? I, yeah. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. In, in one sense, I think, you know, it was because, I mean, it's like, especially since I just graduated from Columbia with my master's in spring. Um, and then after a while, you know, it might not have been the direct the reason why I retired then, but the threat of it is always there. And it's always something you think about because it's like, okay, is the next one going to be the one or, you know, is it worth continuing to put yourself through these hits? Um, and like, basically it's like, you know, Hey, here I am. I, I'm set up for life after football. I've done all these things that I needed to, is it worth it? You know, and I've had those conversations with family. I've had those conversations with friends and, the love of the game was just always enough to keep me going, and, and you know, saying, "Hey, you know, I'm not, I'm not ready to walk away yet." Now, when you did uh, officially walk away, when you were a member of the Patriots, how did that go? Do you call them? Do you talk to Belichick? Like, how does it work? Yeah, so I, I well, I went up there and I seen the trainers, and I had my knee checked out, and um, I kind of did all that stuff, and then, you know. After I was presented with the options and uh, what the best courses of action would be, you know, I, I just had to make the call, man. I, so I called the receiver coach. We spoke a couple of times. Um, originally, they were like, well, look, man, we can give you more time, you know. And then after a while, I was just like, look, man, you know, it's, it's just not going to work. And then just being realistic and about the whole situation that I called, you know, Coach Belichick, he called me. And then, you know, we spoke as well. And, you know, they were – incredibly classy and gracious and 
you know, we wish each other the best of luck and then went our separate ways. Wow. That, you mentioned Columbia. So you graduated with your, you got your master's and you got a 4.0 GPA. Like how the hell do you pull that off? <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, I don't know, man. In my mind, it was kind of like one thing I realized as a football player, like people think, you know, you're cool, right? Or they think you're a certain, well, my brother, when he got done playing and I have other family members that also played a long time, it's like a former player is almost like they, they look at you kind of like, oh, you must be, you know, really sad that you can't play football anymore. Or like, you know, like, oh, man, I'm sorry your knees or your shoulders went out and you can't do what you love. You know, and it was like I didn't want that for myself. And it's they just assume you're not a smart guy. They assume <laughs> that, you know, you can't read very well and all these things. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. You know, man. I mean, you're hitting on yeah. all things. It's so true. Everything you're hitting on, and, and what you said about people coming at you, and like looking at you with a song, sad face, like, "Oh, can you not watch football on TV? Is it just hurt?" I'm like, "No, I'm good, man. I feel really good about like, I I feel good about where I'm at. Like, I I actually I always thought about what I would do post football, and I feel good. I, I'm actually really enjoying my life right now. But they just want to come at you like a puppy dog face, like you tell you how you feel. I'm like, no, nah, man, you just worry about yourself. Yeah, like I'm like you don't understand how happy I am not to be in training camp right now. Like this is the best feeling I've ever had. What do you mean you're sorry? You know, like I could I won't even watch football during the year. Like during the season, I don't watch football games. I couldn't tell you like who the best teams are if they're not if I don't play them on Sunday and they're in film. I don't watch them. I don't see them. I'm excited this year to watch as much football as possible because I don't have to stress about going and doing it. You know, every Sunday. So, so true. Yeah, I mean, the, so true. I watch more football now than I ever did when I was when I was playing. I watched who we were going to play that next week, and I wasn't really aware of the storylines or anything happening around me. And now I'm like, yeah, I watch. It's pretty fun actually to watch a lot of the games, watch the whatever NFL Network channel or the Red Zone package deal. I'm like, this is this is pretty cool, man. I'm actually a lot bigger fan now. Exactly, you could be a fan again, man. So my thing was this: like as a football player, you know, people just assume you're stupid, right? So I'm like, okay. You know, I got into Columbia, um, applied a couple, like, three years ago. And I'm like, I don't want to just do it. I want to do it well. Like, you know, so when a fo- when they meet you at A.J. Hawk and then when they get done, they say, man, A.J. Hawk is pretty smart. Like, he's a football player, and I just didn't, you know, realize how intellectually gifted he is, right? Well, it's hard for A.J. Hawk to talk to every person everywhere to prove to them he's not a dumb jock or a football player. So being able to go to Columbia and – you know, striving for the 4.0, it was like a way to, for people to say, okay, this guy has a little bit of smarts without me having to have the conversation with everybody individually. And, you know, that thing, that was the biggest benefit. And, uh, you know, I'm glad I did it the way I did. Where does that come from? I mean, that's some like forward thinking, like, like you said, a highly high level stuff. Like, does that come from your parents or what? Um, I think it was just kind of just, uh, learn, man. You know, I, Honestly, my brother, and I keep referencing him, but it was like, you know, my brother's 10 years older than me. So a lot of the experience that I have, and that was me fighting to get to the NFL, you know, what I did while I was there, how to handle fans, you know, preparing for life after. I got to see all that experience through his experience, right? So he's literally taught me everything that I know through living and literally teaching me. So, you know, the fact that I got to see him in that light and, and, you know, that's what kind of taught me. And I'm the kind of person that learns from what other people do, other people do as well as, you know, my own experience. So how old were you when your brother got drafted? Uh, I was 12, I believe. Might have been 11. 11 years old when he got drafted. So you got to live through him all, that whole time. He was the, the six years he was on the Bengals. You, were you able to go to Cincinnati and watch a lot of the games and be around him? Oh, yeah, all the time. So I, I like spend a lot majority of my childhood. I'm from Pennsylvania, but the majority of my childhood was spent between there and Cincinnati. Um, yeah, so I got to live through the whole thing. And then he left there. He went to uh, the Panthers for a year, and then he finished with the Patriots, uh, three years with the Patriots. Wow. So did you – did that make it – watching your brother play in the NFL, did that make it seem like this goal was possible? It did and it it, it it did and it didn't because like I said he was always decorated man he you know he was a big 33 player um, second round draft pick you know so he's always been a star I have never been a star like my entire 32 years of football I've never been like a star um, 
which was fine because I've carved out in, uh, my my niche and you know I understand football in a, in a different way and I've always been able to make myself valuable you know but it was a process for me figuring out exactly what I told you that it wasn't going to happen for me the way it happened for him and once I came to grips with that and, and you know I was able to kind of formulate my process a little different and and use it the best of my abilities and, and max out you know the opportunities that I got and and my time in the NFL. What was Jay Gruden like as an offensive coordinator? I like Jay. Jay was like a player's coach. Um, the the big thing Jay has is he understands it because he played the game. I mean, he, he was like an arena legend. So he would understand some of the times when you're like, well, this isn't going to work because I know on theory it's this, but I'm out there and this guy is this way. And this way, you know, he was really good with that. And he understood it. He almost coached to it in a sense, man. And he just let us play. He just let us play and, I mean, we didn't know what the heck we had at 211. Like, we had no idea. Like the studs. Like, we didn't know. I remember looked. Andy got hurt. Yeah. Like, Andy hurt his finger, like, <laughs> two plays into the first game and left. And so we're like, oh, man, this guy is soft. Like, <laughs> look what we got. He, he comes back the next game. He Like, until last year, he went, like, six straight years without missing a snap. So... You know, nobody knew what we were, man. Yeah, and, and talking to uh, – it was fun talking to Andy and, and A.J., both Andy Dalton and A.J. Green, about that year. It was their rookie year, and Jay Gruden, who's the head coach of the Redskins now, was the coordinator. And I remember asking him, like, what was it like with Jay? Because all I know is of his brother on TV and watching him when he coached. And I was like, man, was that, like, just nuts? And he was like a, like a drill sergeant going crazy. And they're like, man, Jay was the best. They're like – we would literally like draw plays up in the sand pretty much. And he would he would tell me if we got inside the 30, throw it up to AJ. If we're in the red zone, throw it up. He's like, AJ had like 15 touchdowns or something. Exactly. That's exactly what we did too, man. Like he would just uh, just just throw it to AJ. He's right over there. Like, that's not the play. But <laughs> he was like, he's better than that guy. You know, how could you argue it? Yeah. It's about matchups. It really is. And he he knows. <laughs> Who knows how he's gonna Yeah. If he can figure it out, if they can figure out what to do with Kirk Cousins in uh in Washington, but what made me think about your Columbia deal? So, did you move to Manhattan, and like, how long did it take to get through your masters? Um, so it took me like two and a half years. I didn't move there. I uh, I would commute in the off season. So the first year I was in Tampa, and all of my classes I was scheduled for one day because they were one. You know, it's a one week or one day a week class, so it'd be like three hour long classes one day a week. I was scheduled on the same day. I would leave Tampa at like 5.30 in the morning, fly to New York, classes all day, and then my flight home would leave at like 11 p.m. And I would go back to Tampa, back to training the offseason. And this offseason, I did it from L.A. And it was the same thing. I would wake up at like 4 a.m. at the airport, fly across the country to New York for classes all day, and then at 10.30 at night, I would fly right back to L.A. Wow. And did you expect, was that like a goal you set that you were going to get a 4.0? Yeah, that was a goal that I, that I set. Yeah, so I took it very serious, very serious. How do you actually follow through on that? That's what blows my mind. Like, I just to think you can you can never really have any missteps. I mean, that was it, man. I, you know, like I'm a I'm a goal oriented person. Like I don't like like if there's a, if somebody presented me right now with a deal that I had to sign by tomorrow and I could make fifty million dollars, I wouldn't do it because it doesn't like. That's not my natural process. Things take forever. It took me six, four years to get in the NFL, and that's, like, normal for me, right? So setting a goal, like, okay, I'm going to do this, and I know it's going to be long, and it's going to be tedious, but I'll be good for it. And at the end, it, it feels that much better. So, yeah, I, I was just very conscious of it kind of at all times, like every test, every paper, every presentation, you know, all that stuff comes, comes into play. Well, good for you, man. That's something that not really – not many people can can accomplish. So yeah, that's that's pretty speaks to who you are. But what so what's what do you do now? Like what's next for you? I've seen you, as like you say, reality show. Are you going to act? Are you going to write? What are you going to do? Get into TV? Like what's the plan? Yeah, I mean, I I, I kind of want to do everything, man. I don't want to pigeonhole myself. Um, but it's like this. Like I know people who like, yeah, I want to do this one day, that the next, this the next day, and there's a lot of people like that. Um, and and sometimes those guys get you know, kind of blown off as well. But the difference between like, you know, being a quack and being successful is like execution. So I have a lot of things I want to do. You know, I do want to do broadcasting. Um, 
you know, I have a lot of offers or, or opportunities and, and, you know, podcasts, some business opportunities, some entrepreneurial aspirations. Um, I had the pleasure of working with Maverick Carter and LeBron James's companies that, you know, I'll probably continue on doing that. You know, I just sold a TV show. Um, I'm executive producing on another film. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that are, you know, I haven't irons in the fire, but, you know, and I'm confident I can execute. And I mean, that's, that's the name of the game. And if I can just be patient and kind of let those things just play out, like I've done everything else, I think I'll be okay. How do you get in? Like, how do you even begin that? As you say, you sold a TV show and you're executive producing. Uh, how does that even start? It's, I mean, more than anything, I think what I'm really good at is networking. And I'm not like a fake networker where I like want to fake be your friend or whatever. Like, if I don't like you, I, I don't like you. We won't talk. But there's not many people I don't like. But, you know, the ones that I do, I stay in, in touch with, man. I mean, years and years or anyone who supports me or, you know, you drop me a line, I'm going to stay. I'm going to send you an email. I'm going to shoot you a text. And I think just over the years, I mean, a lot of people meet you. They always remember how you treat them when you're on top. So in my time in the NFL, there was no one that I act you know, act like I was too, too big for, or anything. And, you know, I let everybody kind of experience it with me. I'm sending jerseys off, you know, I'm sending letters, I'm sending tickets. And I think it just kind of came, comes back to me over time. So a guy that watched fourth and long, he was a fourth and long fan. Um, he was an intern at CAA at the time. He reached out to me on Facebook, like, Hey man, this is what you let you know. You were my favorite on the show. You should have won. Keep killing it. I stayed in contact with the guy as, as my career took off, his career took off. And, you know, he he kind of facilitated a, they I had an offer for my movie, my movie rights, for my options, for my life rights um, that I passed on. And we're kind of still, you know, going through the process of going through offers. And, you know, we started going around pitching TV shows and we're like on show number three already. And it's just literally just being able to find the right people and treating them right and looking for the, the best people to get a thing done, man. That's what I'm about. I want to find someone who's good at something. And then use their talent. I don't want to be the man. I don't care to be the guy who's a star. I just want to build good relationships and do good content and do good work and great projects. And whoever that is to make them the best, that's what I'm about. Do you want to act in some of these things as well? I mean, if, if, it, if the situation calls for it. I just did my first acting. My nephew is did a commitment video that last week we or a couple weeks ago we filmed. And I'm acting in there with Gary Owen. So... You know, hopefully it has good reviews. I actually am acting in another show in a couple of in a couple of weeks as well. So we'll see how it goes, man. It's it's always fun to say you did it, right? Yeah. Like, so I mean, that's what I'm about. Like, yeah, I did it. That'd be that'd be cool. I'm not trying to be Denzel. <laughs> I just wanna I just wanna do cool stuff, you know? Yeah, Gary Owen the comic. Yeah, man. Yep, Cincinnati native. I'm sure you 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 seen him around there your Bengal days. He's a funny dude, man. His his videos. Yeah, I, I've seen. Yeah, I love stand up. So I've seen a lot of his stuff. Um. What I saw a picture of you sitting with Kobe somewhere. Where was that? Kobe's like, like a mythical figure to me. I feel like. Yeah, yeah. That's why he's my profile pic to show <laughs> I sat beside Kobe one day. We're not friends, but I did sit beside him and have a picture of it to prove it. And that was uh, the Players Tribune. I, I was on the, the board for them, uh, the athlete board, and they have like their annual meeting every year. And that was one of the years I was there. It's like a bunch of people that are far bigger names than me that I shouldn't be in the room with. So <laughs> I'll make sure I always get the pictures for it did, to prove I was there. <laughs> so how, what did you do? Did you squeeze down and bump someone out of the way to get next to Kobe? I didn't. I sat down first because I'm the short guy. So the short guy's always in the front. Mm -hmm. But the superstar is also always in the front. <laughs> so it worked out to where, you know, the superstar's to the left and the short guy's to the right. Nice, man. Yeah, that's – uh. he just – I don't know if you saw, he recently went and spoke to the Chargers in L.A. Did you see that video? I did, man. I did. I went and bought that book too. Yeah. Hey, he's Kobe's a weird, like, like a weirdly, uh, like intellectual. Even though he didn't even go to college, I know he went straight from high school, but he's what fluent in Italian because he grew up over there with his parents and his dad playing. And he just he's into so many weird things. I saw his documentary. Was it the Muse of Kobe? Uh huh. Like I, yeah. I don't know. When an interesting guy it has like tech companies. Do, do you? models certain things you do over like how his path has been no question i mean obviously i'm not to the level kobe is and, and some of the resources and, and reach he has obviously you know dwarfs mine but he's a very smart guy man and he he's a guy who always leverages you know what he has and kind of maximizes and, and like you said he's a he's a mystical guy in the sense that 
he purposely doesn't give a lot of himself to the media, to people. And it's kind of always hard to think, say, to figure out what he's thinking. And I respect that. You know what I mean? I, I respect guys who move, move that way. And, you know, yeah, I mean, we've, we've had some conversations and um, I'm in with a couple of people in his circle that, you know, we may have some more meetings and stuff about. So he's a guy I look up to, man. I mean, just being able to to use the sport and, and go into the business world and life after football or sport in general, being successful. Now, what do you do with uh, with LeBron and Maverick Carter at uh, at Uninterrupted? So I was an intern there, man. So what happened was I needed an internship to fulfill my Columbia degree requirements. And as soon as I got to Cleveland, I connected with Maverick. Like I was like scouring everyone that I knew, like, hey, do you have Maverick Carter's number? Do you have Maverick? And so I finally got to him. I'm like, you know, hey, I'm so-and-so. I play for the Browns. I, you know, I want to come intern. And he's like, what? I'm like, yeah, man, I want to I want to come intern. So I just kept bugging him and bugging him and bugging him. And then after a while, he's like, man, this kid is serious. So this offseason, I just, you know, moved up to L.A. with me and the family, literally just to to intern under Maverick. Um, and it was a, it was an incredible experience, man. He pulled the curtain back and showed so many things business wise. He's such a business savvy and, you know, smart guy. And he commands a room when he gets up there. And it's like, you know, being able to learn from him has, has been huge for me moving forward. So I was in business development. And, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm kind of leaning towards moving on there full time. Wow. What's his exact title with the, like, what's Mav's title? Do you know? I don't know. I guess business partner, business manager. You know, he runs like all the companies. He runs all the companies. So they have uninterrupted which is a sports media platform spring hill the production company that does movies documentaries tv shows um they have you know robot marketing which is a marketing company in new york they have the foundation you know you know the things and he kind of all the deals he's like the quarterback yeah he's done he's done well for himself and I, I remember hearing about him years and years ago when LeBron was first coming out. Um, but, yeah, LeBron's another one of those dudes, like almost like a billionaire already, and who knows what's going to happen in the next 20 years with all the contacts he's made. No question, man. No question. They do an incredible job of, of leveraging, you know, the access and, and, and status they have, and that's that's what business is, man. You have to leverage everything. I mean, that's, you know, that's what I've been able to do. People, more people know me than they probably should because to be, if I'm being all the way honest, I didn't do all that much in the NFL. So, like you said, like, why does Cincinnati fan love me? I don't know why they love me, but you know, it's just the ability to be able to leverage things and, and, and kind of maximize what you're doing. And that's, that's business one on one. No, it's simple because you're a good dude. To pe- or you're likable and you're authentic. That's why people like you. And that's why you, you were able to make these connections. And that's a tough thing to do. Be, you want to do the right things and network and follow through and reach out to people, but it's a fine line, man. It's tough not to be a huge douchebag and bug people and, and do things just to do them instead of like, hey, what can I get from this guy? What can right. he do for me? Right, right, man. That's that's very true, man. That's very true. Yeah. You know, I always try to provide value first. You know what I mean? And that kind of shows. Look, I don't want anything. I just want to, you know, if stars align and you know I can be a resource, awesome. Vice versa, awesome. But just this is who I am, and hopefully that that mirrors with who who you are. Awesome, man. Well, I'll wrap this thing up. Where uh, where would you send people to uh, find you? First off, also before I even mention, we'll, we'll link up all your things. Your your Twitter handle is at Hawk. So my last name is. Uh, I knew this. Was I, I, I knew this was coming. I'm not upset. I'm like jealous. Like, what year did you join Twitter? I joined Twitter a long time ago, but that's not. I like grinded. To get the track, you know, I have Facebook slash Hawk, I have Instagram at Hawk, and I have Twitter at Hawk. And a lot of it was just finding, knowing the right people and, and putting it all together. Wow. I always thought to myself, like, man, I bet AJ Hawk is <laughs> jealous right now of, of my handles. <laughs> well, yeah, I couldn't get, I, I'm, I joined late, so I'm official AJ Hawk. I'm not really super active or great on, on the platform. Um, but yeah, that's a, it's a great Twitter handle, man. At Hawk, like Tony Hawk, Tony Hawk is probably pissed actually. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. It was like, uh, that's like one of my biggest accomplishments is getting the trifecta of at Hawk. <laughs> it's like, that's huge for me. 
All right. Is there a is there a website or anything you have that you want would uh, would send people to? Nah, man. Just you know, find me on social. Like I said, ad hoc. Very easy. Um, and that's pretty much it, man. That's pretty much it. Yep, they will find you. We will link up all your stuff too as well when we post this. But really, really appreciate, it, man. We will. Uh, I'm a fan of everything you do, and it's it's inspiring too. So I will uh, stay in touch, and I'll, I'll be following everything you you do down the road. Awesome. I appreciate that the time, AJ, and uh, take care, man. I'm sure we'll link up here soon. All right, man. Thank you. We're glad you could join us for today's conversation. After you subscribe to the show, head over to thehawkcast.com or reach out to AJ directly on Twitter at OfficialAJHawk to recommend future guests that will help us inspire people to keep talking. Thanks again, and we look forward to speaking with you next time on The Hawkcast.